five four three two one we are live the crossover show continues brent leary crm essentials is back for more how we doing is it back for more or we, i'm over to you for more is that how it <laughs> over goes? to me it's a, <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question well we assigned our characters yesterday so i guess we're gonna we could stick That's with right. that the homicide uh, law and order vibe i was frank yeah. Frank Pembleton, because you know he and I look alike, <laughs> <laughs> and you were uh, Lenny Briscoe, right? I was Lenny because we look so much alike. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> anyhow, for those of you who uh, who missed out on yesterday, we had a really good discussion around the hybrid events. Brett had me in the hot seat, talk creative event design, uh, tried to give my motivational speech, better events. And uh, but today we're going to talk workplace data privacy to kick off, which is kind of that was the teaser, Brent. We we teased this real nice, I thought. Yeah, you know, we, had it, we we had to give them a little something to actually make the crossover happen. So yeah, exactly, awesome. and and the thing is, look, I know probably some of you out there are like, oh man, data privacy. We talk about that again. This is going to be cutting edge stuff because Brent's got fresh data fresh research and so we're going to get into this i think from some different angles than than maybe maybe you've heard before so i think that's going to be cool and then to complete the crossover action i'm going to ask brent a bit about the art of enterprise video because if you haven't figured it out by now brent does video <laughs> if you hang out on linkedin you're going to see brent live on video you too can crash his shows like i do with, <laughs> with pesky comments Brent, it was really funny actually the other day, Brent, because I visited uh, your your show where you your CRM players, which is one of your main gigs with with Paul, where you guys get some big big audiences. You were saying goodbye to Nicole France, who was your player in residence for a while, and I was all like getting snarky on the live stream, and it took me a while to realize it wasn't a live stream because I was like, why is Brent ignoring me? <laughs> you were watching the replay. <laughs> yeah, I was on replay, dude. It was two hours later. But anyhow. Oh, wait a minute. Anyhow, I added my comments to that, but, but, uh, yeah. so, okay. So, um, and, and just to get this little piece out of the way, Brent did some research on this for Zoho on workplace data privacy. Zoho is a Diginomica partner. I don't ordinarily feature partners in my videos, but <clears throat> I'm doing it this time because that's the research that Brent did. So, Hey, if you don't like that bailout now, but Hey, most uh, videos on LinkedIn are, are pretty well sponsored by someone but this video is not, but I just wanted to just be the full disclosure route. Um, this is a topic that I'm pretty passionate about. And if you dig into Zoho, you'll find that they've actually taken some fairly extraordinary um, investments to avoid the privacy conundrums that other companies have found themselves in, including building a lot of their own tools, pulling the plug on Google Analytics, building their own AI tools completely so as to not rely on any third-party AI. That's pretty hardcore stuff there. So I think they should be taken seriously on this topic. Um, anyhow, Brent, you did this really interesting customer data privacy report with Zoho, which folks can find online. We should probably pop a link to that at some point. But then you also had a bunch of video chats with these folks. And then there's also been all these industry developments like the whole uh, Google Chrome with with the whole getting rid of third party cookies. And then, oh, wait, we're going <laughs> to we're going to hold off on that for a little bit. So so what do you make? What do you make? What do you make of all these developments? What are you learning? Well, I think the main thing is that uh, privacy is is starting to become an issue from a consumer standpoint because they're learning more about it. And I think the more they learn, the more they realize, oh, my God, I had no idea all this stuff was going on with my data. And so I think, you know, I think it really picked up steam when Apple rolled out the 14.5 iOS update, which turned off opt in default opt in. Uh, so now when uh, a developer, an app developer, you know, wants you to use their app, now they have to put, put up a pop up sign saying, hey, we want to we want to use your data. Is, is it OK if we use your data in order for, you know, to make a better experience? But some of them don't really know how to say that part yet. They just want to use they know that they know that we want to use your data part. They don't know the you know the good reason from a consumer perspective of why we should let them use our data. So uh, so they have to get used to that part. So Apple did that. And then, of course, like you said, Google said that uh, Chrome is going to phase out third party cookies. And uh, now the last week they said, well, we're going to phase them out, but not for another you know, two years you know, before we thought we we're going to do it. 
says, I think privacy is becoming a bigger issue for everyone. But from a consumer standpoint, they're learning more. And the more they hear, the more they don't like what they hear. And now customer, I mean, companies, vendors, technology providers, everybody is going to have to account for it because now the cat is out of the bag. You know, they're not going to go back, you know, to being less knowledgeable what's going on with their data. It's only getting more and more knowledgeable, which is causing more and more issues for vendors and technology providers all around. Absolutely. <clears throat> Quick shout out to Sheldon Snodgrass. Thanks for the kind comment. Sheldon's uh, from old school previous uh, alliances that I've had taught me more about sales than anyone else on the planet. Guy knows sales and sales training. Thank you, Sheldon. I'll never be a great salesperson, but man, <laughs> I've gotten a frig friggin' hell of a lot better thanks to you. So nice to see you in the chat. Um, in Anywho, um, yeah, as far as this is concerned, Brent, I think one of the really interesting things <clears throat> that, that, that came out of your report is that companies get put into these interesting privacy binds. So one of, you collected a lot of data in your report around how companies are relying upon third-party services for what they, or they think they're relying on it for things like lead generation. And, yeah. but what are the implications of that for, for their own customers? And I think these are like, when you talk about privacy awareness, I think these are the things that companies are being forced to now look at. Right. Whereas before they didn't really look at it. They just said, well, yeah, we're going to advertise in these channels and get leads. But now there's this whole thing around what are the implications of that? And do you need to be making your customers aware of those practices and how that affects their data? Right. I mean, isn't this, this is kind of unraveling a little bit, I think. What, what you know, is your I, view on everything? I, I think it's probably uh, late in the unraveling. It should have happened earlier, but I think we went through the pandemic, you know, and everything had to shut down from like, uh, you know, face to face uh, shopping experiences, you know, where you could, you, for a while there, you, you couldn't go into the market like you traditionally would. Some people go to the market, they use cash. They don't have a loyalty uh, thing. So they could make purchases and nobody would know. <laughs> but now everything is digital. You know, if you if you couldn't shop the way you traditionally had to, you had to shop online, which means there's a digital pathway now. And people know exactly what you're buying, when you're buying it. So it's creating all this data. And we all know the, you know, the more uh, we go digital, the more data that gets collected, the more it's going to be used. Sometimes the use is good. Sometimes the use is, you know, the, the nefarious use. Uh, and then the, the other thing is, you know, these companies sort of get addicted to, to having data and, and they come, you know, become more of a like an ad company than, a, you know, let's say a tech company. You know, before they were selling a, you know, platform, they were selling software, you know, that software starts collecting a lot of data. And then all of a sudden they become an ad company more than they are a tech company. And, you know, you're seeing more and more of that. And I think we're at a point now where because of things like when Apple does something or Google does something or announce something big, it causes people to take notice. And that causes consumers to take notice. And, and now the consumers are being awakened to a certain extent. And that's going to cause ripple effects from everybody that uh, they call a vendor. Mm, absolutely. If you are in the throes of this in your own company, love to hear about it in the chat to the degree you are willing to share that. So please vocalize and we will act on your comments. Reminder that when you post stuff in my chat, we talk about it. So please, please do it. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is, you know, in, in my view, the, you know, this, this kind of, when, when GDPR came out originally, I think it kind of forced this issue around are, are you going to wear a black hat or a white hat? I mean, I know the colors are weird because, you know, it's like cultural racial implications and stuff. So put, put that aside. But the point being like, are you going to, are you going to do right by your customers or, or are you going to continue to kind of sleaze your way along in this fuzzy area? Right. Because when you look at it, the really, the companies that are in trust with customers do it in the right way, right? Like it's it's not like it's not like they don't get your data, but they get your data because you trust them. I always talk I talk about it in terms of like a value exchange. And it seems to me that one of the implications here is you can't sit on the fence anymore, right? You you can't you can't kind of fuzz your way through this. You either have to say, look, we're scummy, 
we're going to get data however we can. And, and that's that, or we're going to do right. And it seems like if you're going to do right, why not get out in front of this a little bit more instead of being dragged along by, Oh, here's another regulation. So now we need to change a little bit more. Here's another, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what? I think you gotta, maybe we gotta look at this as a term, uh, like an addiction. You know, these companies are addicted to this data and it's hard to, to kick the addiction. You know, the addiction makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you've got everything, you know, under control, but you're doing everything you're stealing, you're, 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 you know, causing trouble just to keep that addiction. And I think that's been the way that uh, things have been operating uh, up until pretty much this year. And it's going to be really difficult, you know, for companies to kick the addiction if they feel like they are addicted, if they feel like they're doing wrong to keep this thing going. Some folks might not feel like it's they're doing wrong because, you know, the payoff is too big. But I, I like, you know, the idea of, you know, companies use this software um, traditionally because it's good. It helps them do what they need to do and they've been trusted. But that was software that was installed on your machine. So you didn't really worry too much about, you know, the purposefully data leaks. You know, you had your security issues, you had your technical issues. But when the when the data was all on your your own hard drive, you, you didn't worry about, you know, this data leaking out, you know, for, from a, nefar- a nefarious standpoint. But now that we're in the cloud, this has it's become such a big issue, but it became an issue kind of under the radar until this year. For some reason, this is the year that it came out. I don't know, or, or 2020 was the year it really started to come out. I don't know if it's because more and more people had to do things uh, in an uh, untraditional way, like shopping for groceries online, and, and, and that opened up kind of doing everything digitally. And, and now there's even more data, more, more privacy data or more personal data. Like, you know, we're using these devices, you know, like you have your, your iPhone, you have your Apple watch, it's collecting data on your health. That's, you know, more and more of these issues just started coming to the forefront. And I think now you can't get away from it. You can't turn away from it. But what do you do if you're a company is kind of addicted to having this data? And never having to ask for it before, you could always kind of take it under the, under the table, so to speak. We got Sandy Lowe chiming in. She liked my "sleaze your way along" phrase. Unfortunately, Sandy, <laughs> I think there's a lot of companies that still fall in that description. Sandy from Zoho, there, uh, who who actually has Brent taken credit for our relationship. So yeah, know, <laughs> the right. fact that you and I have been collaborating <laughs> on some stuff. So so Sandy, <laughs> take your props. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about further about this this survey. It was interesting. Some of the goals you looked at, you you really dug into um, the whether your respondents understand third party software and the implications of installing tracking software, the comfort level at how ad platform vendors explain this. Because I think one of the things people don't always realize is how the ad platform vendors use data. In other words, you raised the issue earlier of like that that do do you realize that your customer data could become part of a marketplace, right? So that mm-hmm. so an ad platform could take that data and package it up and actually sell it to someone else. Like, do you realize those things? Um, so comfort level on how that data is being used. And so you guys conducted a survey around that and you came up with a lot of interesting stuff, including like a data privacy confidence score uh and you 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 found some interesting findings as well i won't go into all of them um but there seemed to be some some level of knowledgeability around all of this but i got the impression though that while there was a growing awareness it didn't seem like a lot of companies had really figured this all out because it seemed like 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 they're still using a lot of these tools they're kind of understanding it but they're still kind of figuring it fudging their way along somehow what 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 did you come up with from that yeah, any surprises I, I, you know i think the surprise to me was and, and we uh we surveyed over 1400 folks uh in the u.s and canada and um i think the main thing is there seemed to be a pretty significant comfort level uh with what was going on and they also they and this is all you know they're self-reporting they self-reported how confident they are with 
using these platforms and the way that these platforms use their customer data. And they were pretty comfortable about their, their knowledge of these platforms. But I tend to believe that it's one of those, the less you know, the more you think you know. And then mm-hmm. as you learn more, then you really realize, I don't know enough. I don't know enough at all. So I tend to believe that the scores that we got, for example, uh, I did this uh, like a tracking knowledge ratio. So just a blanket question around, uh, you know, do you know that you know, you, the stuff that you add, these you know, add-ons to your website or plugins, do you know that uh, these folks are adding third-party trackers? There's a five, uh, almost a six to one uh, ratio to say, yeah, we know it. I tend to believe that they didn't know it to the extent of what it, which it was going on. So it'll be really interesting to see next year when we do this. I think we're at the at the end of this year and then the report comes out next year. How that changes now that there's more information out. For example, uh, there is a really uh, interesting article that I was reading as we were doing this. And it was about an organization um, that was getting ready to put up a website. And the, the one of the key things they said is this organization, we aren't in the tracking our website users. That's not what we're here for. We're not you know, trying to capture a lot of data around that. So, But they needed to make a website. And so they uh, created the website using uh, three known plugins. So they knew that they were using... You know, a plugin for Facebook, a plugin from Twitter, and a plugin from uh, Discuss for commenting. So, what they didn't know is that although uh, the Twitter and Facebook plugins, they didn't install any additional trackers, the Discuss plugin added 21 trackers, 20 to 21 trackers to 21 different data uh, companies, which meant that that data that was coming into their uh, their website, and that's all their you know their website visitor data and whatever data other stuff that got collected through forms and things like that. All of that was not only open to the Twitter and Facebook stuff, but and the Discuss stuff, but through Discuss, twenty one additional companies had access to it. So although they did not want to be a tracking they didn't want to track their users, the website. What they didn't know was that they were actually aiding and abetting 21 vendors who they had no direct relationship with, giving that their, their website visitor data directly to these 21 companies. And they don't know what, what's going to happen with that data. They don't have any direct relationship with it. So once again, that was a case of, yeah, we thought we knew. And then we found mm-hmm. out we didn't know. Which brings us to Alan's timely question. Have we passed the point of no return in terms of data and privacy? I I, I can't say yes to that, but I can say the longer it's out there, the harder it definitely gets. Because let's face it, almost to a certain extent, kind of the digital economy is is based off of tracking. It's going to be hard to rip it up. Um, But I think there's opportunities you know, for companies, there are some companies that did it from the beginning, said, hey, we're, we're going to we're not going to do this out of the gate. So they're OK. And I think you see a growing number of those new companies created like that. But uh, Alan does have a point. I mean, I think the longer you're you've been dependent on tracking the heart and it's, you know, the harder their addiction is to, to, to get over. And it's not going to be easy. But as you said earlier, it might not be easy. But is it right? Do, is it the right thing to do for for our customers? Is it the right thing to do for our employees who have to interact with customers and be try to be truthful and transparent with them? It, if it means something to you for that to take place, then regardless of the difficulty, you're going to do it one way or the other. Yeah. I mean, Alan, one thing that I think about with your comment is, you know, you know, Brent, Brent, you referred to that sort of odd sense that, that companies in the survey that you looked at had a certain comfort level perhaps with how things are, but how quickly that changes, right? So in other words, like another regulation gets passed that that changes how you use third-party ad platforms. Well, now they have to change their practices, just like, you know, Chrome changing the cookie policy or the iOS change that you referred to. Uh, Or you get a nice, juicy customer lawsuit, you know? (laughs) 
And, and, and so to me, once again, it does, it just raises the question of whether you're going to be constantly chasing the stuff from behind and staying one step ahead of the sort of privacy pitchfork, or are you going to get out in front? And I think one really interesting thing about like, you know, my discussions that I've done, cause I've written some data privacy articles around Zoho's approach in the past. And one provocative aspect, they talk a lot about the surveillance economy and, and and it's a provocative phrase, right? Because we don't tend to think about these tools as surveillance tools. But in a way, I think that language is quite important to ponder, right? Which is that, you know, yeah, you are in a sense being surveilled, perhaps for the purposes of monetization rather than like more nefarious reasons, but you're still being surveilled. Well, even that, that last example, even when the vendor, the, the, the folks putting up the website say our, our business is not, we don't want to track. We're not into that. That's not our thing. But if they use technology from other companies that does that, that sends that data to these 21 additional companies, who knows what they might do with it. So even when you think you're trying not to do that, or your intention isn't to do that using a, you know, a certain kind of technology from certain companies, you absolutely are, you know, a, su a surveillance aider and a better, even if you don't mean to be and you don't want to be, which is kind of hard to kind of hard to, uh, you know, get your head around because your main objective is the, you know, you, for one thing. And all of a sudden you're collecting and sending valuable data to folks that you don't even have a direct relationship with. You don't know what they're going to do. You don't know how they're going to do it and it becomes it, it really does become, you know, just a, a funnel, uh, you know, a data funnel with all sorts of data spilling out at the sides. And there are people there to collect. it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I, the other really interesting thing about this discussion is that I think is slow moving at the moment, but I think will become more and more of a factor is is you talked about this, you could call it digital exhaust, right? Like all the, the tools we're using create this constant digital flow, which then creates implications on who has access to that. And you think about it from an employer perspective, right? So the more I'm working in a remote capacity or in a hybrid capacity, I'm using all these new tools. Well, those tools also for an employer provide a really handy way of tracking me, my performance, my whereabouts. Uh, you can now judge me based on all kinds of metrics you could create. And one thing I, I mentioned in our last show is I was on a pretty high profile little private event for media with some big players. The Zoom CEO was there, some high level people from Salesforce. And I, I asked them, I was like, what are your obligations here to your own customers as far as how they're using these tools? You know, Microsoft got into trouble for this. Like, they put out some stuff around their uh, their collaboration policies, and then they had to backtrack around what kind of data is being collected. And so I asked them, I was like, what are your obligations here for your customers? Because I think a lot of times vendors just say, well, our tools are neutral. But I'm like, well, what if you have a customer who's using those tools in a way that that you don't agree with that like, do you have an obligation now to educate at least I'm not telling them to walk away from business necessarily, but, but, but are you educating your customers around that? And I think this is going to get really interesting, right? Because I think employees are going to start voting at least the ones that have options are going to start voting with their feet and saying, I'm not comfortable with how this data is being used. So I think that's another interesting aspect of this discussion. And, and I know that, that that Zoho spent some time on this also because that's how I originally started thinking about it. I think you know the data discussion it goes it's open and it's going in all the directions that it it probably needs to go. You know, like you said, the employees, you, you got work from home now. So you're doing you everybody's using Zoom or Teams or whatever it is. And uh, so there's a lot of discussions taking place, you know, between, you know, people working in the same company, partners working with their vendors, customers. I mean, so these conversations through all these collaborative tools are being recorded. They're being transcribed and then they're being run through, you know, sentiment analysis. 
Uh, so once again, things that happened when you were in the good old days of the pre-pandemic where you had to go to the office and go to a meeting room and, and then you talk, you know, between yourselves and you, you don't, nothing is going on until, you know, somebody, you know, turns on a recorder or some sort. Now, when you jump on Zoom or something, Everything is game. You know, you're sitting in your home office. Anything that happens in the home is being you can see it. So it's going to be used somehow. So how should you handle these situations? Because they're only going to become more frequent. You know, you, yeah. do I want my uh, everything I say transcribed? Every look on my face being you know analyzed because you got facial recognition. And then you're going to start seeing, yo. Know, well, Brent made a, a his brow, his right brow went up when this was said. We right. need to analyze it. I do. Do we want that? I don't want that. And I want to know if that's taking place so I can say, well, I'll, I'll see you on the next one because I don't want to be involved on this one. Absolutely. Alan points out a key element is permission. The default is yes, GDPR changes a bit. Alan and Brent brought up earlier about the iOS where the default is now no and you have to opt into services. And I think that's really interesting to start seeing that shift because to your point, the the default is yes. I think one of the problems though that persists is in the consumer space is these tr these happy trade-offs that we make, right? Where, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook. I know that they're terms of service are objectionable in many ways. And if I gave those terms of service to my lawyer, they wouldn't know what to do with them. They're not comprehensible. And yet I participate on that platform. And, you know, so, so I think these kinds of things are tricky, right? Did I really opt in? I mean, and this is where I think companies are going to get, hopefully feel a little more heat. And, and to your point, there are some folks trying to do things differently. I mean, I got ping ping recently from some PR stuff you referred to before our show about some new alliances that are forming around privacy free search, you know, privacy first search engines and stuff like that. Um, I've, I've been seeing more and more of the data monetization schemes around shouldn't consumers be compensated for their data, which is really interesting. And, and so creating networks where if you participate in this network, you're actually compensated for the use of your data. How many of those will actually work? I don't really know, but it's super interesting to reframe that discussion around actually that data has a financial value and I should choose, you know, w when I broker it. Of course, there's all kinds of problems with that too, but it's interesting to have those discussions. You know, the other thing that's interesting too is the, the reason why Google had to kind of delay the phase out of the third party cookies. You know, they, they were trying to uh, replace third party cookies with this thing they call flock was a federated learning of uh, cohorts, something like that. So they're trying to like remove the direct, the ability for folks to go one-on-one, -on -one, take this data and use it from a one-on-one -on -one perspective to try to abstract it and create what they call these cohorts. So they look at, you know, uh, individuals browsing and where they go and what they do and any other information they can and fine. And then try to match, create a group of people that, uh, that have similar kind of, you know, makeup and then create a cohort. And then, so that kind of gives you a layer of extraction between the individual by saying, well, you can't have access to the personal information of the individual, but this individual fits this cohort. And here's, you know, kind of the, mm -hmm. the data around the cohort, but the, the, the pushback came from, uh, like tech now, other browsers uh, and certain kind of websites, retail websites to say, this all seems to me to be putting even more power in the hands of Google. Right. Because everybody right now, the whole system is built on the third party cookie thing. And that's not something that's owned by anyone thing, but now you're, you're going to replace that with this flock thing, which is a Google in uh, invention, which, but it has to go, you know, everybody has to buy into it in order for it to work. But there seemed to be a bit of a, a, a power struggle because companies are like, uh, I don't think we should just replace something that we all are comfortable with, with something that is made by one company to rule. And that was the big pushback. It wasn't really about the privacy mm. aspect. It was more about who's going to, you know, who's going to own the right to still run ads the way that, you know, that whoever wants to run them runs them. And whatever vehicle they want to have in there, well, you know, whoever has that potential to put that in place, 
does that get shift the power to them more than what's going on currently? Mm, absolutely. Zachary, earlier you said uh, you have so many thoughts. Um, <clears throat> we're going to probably wrap the privacy discussion in a few minutes. So love to hear a couple of those thoughts if you get a chance before we wrap up. Um, yeah, I, I think that's really interesting, Brent. And when you look at the scrutiny that big tech is under for monopolistic practices right now, which is a growing trend from both the left and the right for different reasons, yeah. it's probably not the right time for Google to create uh, what could be perceived as a monopolistic definition of of data. And one would suspect that was part of the reason why they pull back. But I hear what you're saying. And, and you know, I think that cohort thing is really interesting because it's like, well, defining people based on cohorts is pretty pretty tricky sometimes like good luck defining me for example but <laughs> yeah, actually you, you scared me earlier too because you started making me think like in four years am i going to hear from like a digonomica bot halfway through the day that's like john i noticed you're feeling grouchy today there's been your your smile ratio has gone down and i've noticed a an edgy tone in your email correspondence with your partners you know do you need to take a a, a wellness break you know, it's like, or, it's or like maybe that. not even asking you if you need it. Just say we're putting you on an, uh, yeah, a yeah, yeah, yeah. John. John, sorry you don't have access to your email or internet connection right now, but you were <laughs> on a, you were on a wellness break based on the sentiment that you've been displaying in your correspondence and in your interactions. I mean, and and we can laugh about this a little bit, but this is this is kind of a real thing, and I think I I, I feel for it because you know, in our industry, there's a whole lot of talk around like. You know, like, for example, with hybrid work, it's like, well, people are going to vote with their feet. You know, the talent will go elsewhere if, if your practices suck. And that's true for like top performers and people who are lucky enough to be sought after for whatever reason. But you know what? There's a lot of good people out there who are more stuck in a current situation than that. And it doesn't mean that they're mediocre. It just means that they're stuck for whatever reason. I feel for people like that because I think they're going to find that a lot of these tools that are so, like like you're saying, it's like there's a trade-off, right? And and we're starting to become aware that the tools that, that we use every day and rely on come with all these trade-offs. And that goes for our workplace tools as well, you know? So Yeah, the whole thing is uh, there's, there's kind of an easy uh, fix to this. And it's just being open and being honest. You know, mm. we want to use your data. Yeah, it's going to help us out. But in return, it's also going to help you out. If uh, companies got to get used to the just being plain and speaking, you know, frankly, and in, in a way that people could easily understand what's going on. And you might be surprised at how, you know, likely people are to say, okay, well, that makes sense. Bam, you know, but they're so they're so used to doing it behind the scenes or you know making a change to their privacy policy that's you know so hidden in the 30,000 pages that it was already there that nobody's going to take the time to really look at that all right whatever now people are starting to take the time and so mm -hmm. it, it's it's time you know time for companies to really rethink how they went about it hey if you were riding dirty so to speak with your data privacy stuff you got to realize that those days are probably over. So you're going to have to figure out a new way to uh, communicate to customers and website visitors or whoever's data that you're looking to use. You're going to have to just say, look, yeah, we're going to do this with your data. We need it for this reason. Yeah, it's going to be good for us, but here's why we think it's a win-win and it's going to be good for you as well. I think you'll be surprised at how many people would be more open to that approach than you know, finding out after the fact, oh my God, they, this is what's been going on for all this time. Yeah. I mean, to me, it's all, it, it's like, there's, there's a transitional process, right? And the first step in that is that self-education that turns into transparency and disclosure. So you're trying to be as open and as clear as possible, not like some bizarre terms of service agreement, but like clear, <laughs> here's how we use your data. You know, thank you for trusting us with your data and so on. Right. And, and from there, let the informed person make a decision. You know, I, I think, and there is more pressure on businesses and I, I think they have to be careful because like, if, if you just derive comfort from the fact that like, oh, well, Facebook or TikTok or whoever, you know, they're, they're having fun with data. Yeah. But consumers are arguably kind of addicted to those services and, I don't think you could say the same about a lot of B2B services, right? You, it's like 
I'm not addicted to that service. I'm actually going to be able to step back and evaluate that carefully. And if I don't like how you use your data, um, you know, I may make a change. And, and I think that's a little bit different than like, you know, where as a consumer, it can be very tough to move off of Facebook. For example, if all of your family are on there and you're trying to keep track of your, your grandmother's health and she's on there or whatever, like that's a pretty like hardcore thing to step away from. I don't think that's true for a lot of enterprise services. It's a different set of criteria. So companies need to be careful about saying, well, consumers don't care. I, I think it's more that consumers feel this strong propulsion towards these certain services. And, and, and I don't think that companies should derive comfort from that is all. So, yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah, companies have to realize you know, uh, consumers are as long as the consumers feel like they have more of a say. Yeah, they're going to say, OK, I'm going to stay on Facebook because I understand it's my I, you know, I want to stay connected with my family. But they don't want a, a vendor to make that call on their behalf unless the vendor right. explains what's happening. That, that's the I think that's kind of the biggest issue with the privacy thing is you're not telling folks what's going on. You're not giving the consumer the right to make the call you're making the call on their behalf and, or you're shielding them from some really important information to help them make the call. Those mm -hmm. things have to change going forward. I think. Yeah. I think uh, just to add one more great thing to the mix too, from a, from a enterprise perspective is this whole thing around APIs. Cause I think uh, APIs are starting to get exposed a little bit. I mean, LinkedIn just had another breach that was based solely on information that was gathered from, you know, from their, from API usage, but, but, it, uh, you know, savvy uh, malware type individuals for lack of a better word can gather that data and, and, you know, concoct these pretty complete profiles of you based on those things. And, and again, it's going to come down to the fact that, well, did you really educate people on what kind of stuff is being exposed and under what circumstances, right? And, and how can that be used? And, so I, I think these are good conversations, Brent. I mean, I, it can be confusing sometimes to wrap your head around all of it, but I, I'm glad that you guys pressed the issue on this. I think it's really interesting. So, Yeah, thanks. I really appreciate that. And I, I think I'll go back to the, the more you know, the more you understand you need to know more. Or the, the more you know, the, the more you understand, my God, I don't know as much as I thought I did. And I think yeah. we're all going through that now. And it's just the kind of just the beginning of this conversation, I think. For folks who want to catch you this week, do you have more stuff coming up? I know you usually have a watching Amazon. Is that coming on Friday? Well, so uh, there's CRM players tomorrow. Okay. And we're, we're going to have Mike Fawcett and uh, Jeff Workgal from Oracle and Mike Fawcett from Arion. He just started a new, uh, new gig research company. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have them on talking about the, the transition of buying power from boom, uh, baby boomers to Gen Zers. That, that's going to be pretty interesting. Um, then, yes, watching Amazon Friday at uh, 5 p.m. And actually, uh, we started something called Watching Privacy on uh, Friday at 11 a.m. And it'll be uh, me and, and Raju Vigesna and uh, Tejas Gaja from, uh, from Zoho. And we're just talking about issues we get a little deep go into kind of some deep dives in some of this stuff so yeah it feels like i i'm never not live streaming you are on the streams all the time so uh, before we wrap up i do want to ask you about that how how do you um know like because this is this so interesting as far as like you know i think we all realize the importance of content to reach audiences and video the importance of video how do you know when you've had a successful video show are you looking at numbers like how do you know oh that was a really good show like how, how do you assess that what is your personal subjective criteria uh so like i would assess this conversation am i am i interested am i really engaged in this am i enjoying this and the answer to all three of those is yes and so that's that's how i judge it I mean, it's like we're, we've been talking for like 40 minutes. It doesn't even feel like it's been nearly that long because right. the subject matter was good and the conversation was good. And the other part thing I, I always look at is the engagement. You know, we, we've got people commenting and, and making good comments. Um, so that that's also a component. And then also the kind of I'll take a couple of clips, a little two two minute snippets of, of a conversation and toss those out there. 
because sometimes, you know, long form conversations scare people off. But mm. if they see, you know, like a two minute clip of something is a self contained clip of, you know, a, a totally well thought out piece of information or a really great part of the discussion. And that does well. And then that also leads to people circling back around and checking out the long form. All those things are kind of the way I look at it. Mm. Yeah, I like that that short clip mentality, right? Like, like I, I tend to reject the idea that people don't enjoy long form stuff, but I also embrace the idea of giving people as many options as possible because it really depends on the person and the rhythm of their week and and how they like to consume stuff. Um, Sandy's saying you're always live somewhere and you're going to run out of Rams hats, dude. Never. Never run out of Rams hats. And you notice, John, I'm not, this is a totally different one. And, and, I, and I broke out the, the Rams jersey for you too. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciate as a as a Patriots <laughs> fan, nothing makes me happier than oh, seeing gosh. a bunch of <laughs> seeing a bunch of Rams, Rams gear on a dude. I, so, I just walked right up into that one. So, you you uh, did. You 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 walked into it. <laughs> In fact, you you had a good show on that recently. I was cracking up because you were talking about like fans and apparel and stuff. And I was making the point that like that you know businesses can learn a lot from sports teams as far as the 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 passion of the consumers and like gosh you could evoke that kind of passion for your for your b2b brand like now you're really on the way you know yeah although i don't see myself wearing a, a jersey for uh, you know acme or something like that but, no yeah. not at all but it's interesting to think <laughs> about what or how do you do it right how do you how do you earn that kind of rabid yeah. loyalty you know are there things about that you could you could emulate. I think some are obviously it's never going to be the same, right? Cause sports, are right. sports but, but you can learn but, stuff from them for sure. I mean, I learned some things that I was talking to uh, Caroline true love. Who's the head of fan global fan engagement for fanatics. So I, like I, I told her, I spend pretty much half my, my monthly income. Goes I saw to that. Ram. So yeah. So yeah, there's lots to learn, you know, fan experience and customer experience. There's they, there's a lot of equal, but that fan experience, I think, goes a little deeper emotionally. And there's some things that you could learn from that, too. Absolutely. Short form, like, say, a few good minutes. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is that sometimes a few good minutes lead to a few more good minutes. So I think that's why Brent ends up, like, pulling out some of the highlight clips that are really <laughs> funny. Like like you had that great one with Esteban that you pulled out as a highlight. Uh, you know, Well, that, that picture... Yeah. Oh my. Well, yeah. The, whenever you see Esteban and uh, Alan uh, Bondi hugged up on a, what appeared to be like a red carpet for a movie premiere, right. you got to ask them about it. I mean, you know, you just got to kind of spring it on them. Like I didn't tell him I was doing that, but and and you could tell by his reaction. See, that's that's the kind of stuff I'm going for uh, when it comes to doing these. You don't want it to just feel like, uh, you know, it's a, a scripted conversation or, or too much of a point. Mm. count. You want to inject some kind of personality. You want to have some fun with it, because to me, the best parts of, of these conversations are the ones that you can tell were completely spontaneous mm. and came about because the, the, the conversation is organic and you kind of let it go where it goes. But then you see you, you get a chance to dig in on something that just popped up. And bam, you got some good stuff. Yeah, like when someone posts blockchain in one of my chats because they know it's going to push my buttons. Because because <laughs> block block the use of the word blockchain is banned on my show. So <laughs> pe 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 people do that just to just to royal me. But but yeah, I think to your point, and you know, I I wish that more vendors understood the power of those live moments. They're so afraid of them, and. Yeah. You know, it, it was interesting because I got pulled into something this week where I'm helping out with a, like a keynote discussion on video and I'm going to be on this little mini discussion panel thing. And we were talking about rehearsals and stuff. And I was telling them like, you know, I recently did one of these things where we had two planning sessions, uh, a rehearsal, a second rehearsal, and then two filmings or whatever. And I was like, huh. with each subsequent uh, edition, the content felt more and more canned, you know? So the best discussion was the first one, you know, oh. but unfortunately nobody saw that one because it was just the brainstorming. But I was like, wow, that was gold, you know? And, yeah. 
And, and, yeah. and so to me, like what I like about what I've learned from watching you and what I try to do as well is like, yeah, let's not overdo it on, on the rehearsal part of, of everything. Like we might want to get on the same page in terms of topics we might want to cover, but let's flow with this thing a little bit. And like, to me, that's the power. And like you said, maybe there's an additional power in then saying, Oh man, that was two minutes. That was really magic. I think I'm going to pull that out and, and feature that separately as a shorter form chunk. So many opportunities that people haven't tapped into. So a lot of potential still. I mean, there's a lot of video out there, but I don't know if there's a lot of good enterprise video out there, I would say. So I I, I, I tend to agree with you. I think a lot of them are, are afraid to re relinquish some control. And so they, they want to keep things very scripted. You know, they don't want any surprises. They, they want to know exactly what's being said. And, you know, me and Paul run into this a lot with Sierra and players. Well, we used to run into it a lot more than we do now. Like somebody would come on and or we invite them on and then their uh, like their PR folks would get involved and they would like to know, you know, do you have a, a list of questions ready? Mm -hmm. And can you, you know, tell us this, this? And, and we like, look, none of that's going to happen. Don't even bother asking. You part of the what part of what makes a good conversation is is the spontaneity, but it's also you know we want people on that we feel like we have a pretty good understanding of who and what they are and what they do, and because we have a certain level of of familiarity, let's say, you don't have to do a whole bunch of that stuff, man. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you you can be real, and that's I think that's the like what we're doing. We didn't have to go through a whole lot. We just basically a couple of texts. Hey, what do you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, let's do that. Oh, okay, we'll do it. We'll use that as the bridge to the. Uh, we're good, you know, and that, and it comes across as a regular conversation. But if it's too stilted or scripted, or uh, tell us about the, I mean, people can pick up on that, and and that turns people. At least it turns me off. It makes it less interesting if it feels like you know you you might as well let's pull out your script and read it in front of me. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm I'm glad that I think. With shows like yours, I think more vendors get a chance to get a little more comfort level with with that environment, which is which is great because to me that's that's what gets exciting about what we could do with with the enterprise, right? Um, that yeah. you know, I I keep trying to tell people like there are no perfect projects. I mean, we in Diginomica when our partners write stories about like customer products and stuff, the feedback that we always come back with is like. Uh, you didn't really touch on the challenges that your customer faced here. And it's like every project had its moment of truth. Like, let's not kid ourselves. I don't care how great your software is. doesn't matter. It's not about that. Like, right. like there's, there's always a moment of truth. And I think that's what people are looking for. And hopefully Brent, we can have a quiet and steady revolution around this topic because there's so much potential for this medium when you can just let it breathe a little bit and, and so hopefully there'll be more of that. But thanks for leading that charge for us. Appreciate it. Learned a lot. Yeah, I, no, I, I I like what you do with the hits and misses thing. Because, I mean, you, you you get out there and you let people know what's up. I mean, you're not agreeing with every guest you have all the time, which makes it more compelling to watch, to be quite honest. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because because uh, I tell my guests, like, because I mostly try to find people who are, like, who I consider like very strongly independent. Cause I just feel like that's, that's what's missing from most of the videos that I see. Um, but I, I tell my potential guests, I'm like, you should watch one of these cause it's kind of jugular and <laughs> just make sure that you're okay with that before we do this. Cause that's how it's going to have to, to be. And it's not like it always has to be that on every video show. Cause I don't oh. think it's always appropriate, but it's like, I, I feel a need for it. And you know, it's funny because we talked about sports, like a lot of what inspired me was some of my favorite sports talk radio shows where where there are a lot of very heated arguments and discussions, right? Because that's what sports yeah. fans do, right? They argue about stuff. It's like, yeah. wait, you said Aaron Rodgers was better than Tom Brady. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> Tom Brady's 43, you know, but I don't care. He's still better than Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers chokes in the playoffs, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you and I could probably have that argument for the next 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm and, holding my tongue right now. Yeah, so. there you go. Right. So, <laughs> and, and I was like, well, what if, what if you can actually do that on the enterprise topics, but like on, but, but not, not just like for the sake of argument, but for the sake of like better products anyway. So 
that that's kind of like what I try to do, but I don't know. I think there's room for a lot of different approaches Yeah, as, as long as it's just informal and not canned, it can be all kinds of different approaches can work. So. Absolutely. I do my one-on-ones, my, my few good minutes. And you know, those are more, you know, conversational. And then we have CRM players and you know, me and Paul ha- like to have fun with that. And we like to have guests that are fun, although they're pretty high level folks. They're still fun. We got, I mean, impromptu guitar playing is likely to come out or, you know, some kind of interesting joke or something. Well, and, that and then one, I have watched. Yeah. Well, and CRM, and sorry to cut you off. I think the other thing about CRM players is it's, you cultivated a real community around that show, which is really interesting too. So, so in that case, you said, let's build a community around what, so it's not just, oh, I'm going to go watch a show. People feel a part of the community around it, which is really cool. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to say about, you were going to say about watching Amazon? Oh yeah. Watching Amazon. That's where me and and, and John Lawson go at it. I mean, we have fun. We're, we're, we've known each other for years. We're very comfortable with each other and we're very comfortable telling each other we're stupid and we get over it. But it's fun. It's fun. And I I enjoy all the different kinds of conversations. That, and and it's really amazing how this it took, you know, it took this pandemic and in live streaming to actually help me come to that realization is that I actually learn a lot more about people and things because of the different kinds of live streams I'm doing. And I, I think it's just great. It's it's helped me tremendously this last year. Yeah. It's amazing what getting off the road can do to <laughs> spark some <laughs> spark some creative change and everything. So yeah. it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how how you mix it up as as a little more travel kicks in. Even though, as you and I have discussed, I think that discussion is still a little premature. Um, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of that this this fall. But it, I've I've been thinking about it too. Like, am I going to do some video stuff when I'm on the road and Anyway, it's interesting, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, a part of me feels like in some ways you, you know, the, the travel's overrated in that like, like you're doing with the full plate of interesting video all week. Why leave? <laughs> why leave home? Uh, hmm. Anyway, it's just interesting. So. Hey, look, I, I know you're going back out next week and it'll be, I can't wait to hear kind of your experiences with that because I'm, you know, I'm, we're in the same boat in terms of we go to a lot of stuff. And so. I, I'm really interested in hearing how you make out next week and that'll help me to kind of, you know, gauge what I'm going to do the rest of the year. Indeed. Taking it month by month right now. So we shall see Brent pleasurable discussion. Thanks for joining. Much appreciated. I hope Man. we, I hope we hit the the homicide law and order threshold. I didn't want to end up at the Allie McBeal practice level. So oh folks, God. Ho- hopefully we came closer to homicide law and order for you guys. Please tell us so, we did because yeah. I don't want to have that. <laughs> yeah. Please, please don't use the words Ally McBeal pertaining to this <laughs> episode, or Brent and I will have to reconsider our, uh, our professional futures. Thanks a lot, life. man. <laughs> All right. Take care, man. Thanks for having me. Later. 